Okay, back to our project with the three Scara Fanuc robots, the Compact Logics L27 ERM redundant Ethernet with motion. Now we're not actually using any servos on this project, but the price was right for the ERM and that's what we're using. This is a controller that has built-in I.O. Digital inputs, digital outputs, analog in-out, and high-speed counter. We are using the digital inputs and outputs, and we're using N analog input, but we're not using analog outputs or the high-speed counter. We've covered the electrical design to the level that I wanted to, and we've talked about program organization or structure. So we're going to go back into the structure a little bit, and then we're going to start talking about I.O. in a little bit more depth. Let's jump in here and do this. This is version 33. That's not changed. That's what we started with. I like to start with the controller organizer completely collapsed into the five groups. The one that we're going to talk about first is the task. We have one task. That's a continuous task, recognized by that little clockwise swirly, main task. And then under the main task, we have programs. And remember, each task can support 100 programs. And each program can be broken down into an unlimited number of subroutines, limited only by your memory. And so we divide up the program into routines. And these routines in each program further granulate the function of each device out there. So each program really, other than the buffer inputs and buffer outputs, the other programs represent some sort of a device that has some personality or logical entity of its own. For safety, we have the CR30, the programmable safety controller or relay. And then the master really represents overall functionality of we'll say the controller as far as mode goes. And then the three robots, they have their own personality, their own functions independent of the master controller. The epoxy dispense, that is a standalone machine that we control with literally discrete inputs and outputs. It's totally on its own, we just trigger it. And then what we get back from it is complete or false. The revolver and the rotary index, those are stepper motors. They're actually a controller driver stepper motor, and they are dual ethernet enabled, and they have a functionality all of their own. And then conveyance really would be the variable frequency drive. So nestled inside of buffer inputs and buffer outputs, we have our, I guess you could say, our groups of intelligence that we wanted to write a program for. Once you have picked a processor or controller, processor and I.O., then you do the I.O. configuration. And we did talk about this before. We have embedded I.O. and we have I.O. on Ethernet. We have no expansion I.O. So we have 16 in, 16 out, and then we also have embedded counters. Right here represents 16 in and 16 out. The embedded analog is four in and two out, and then the embedded counter, that's the high-speed counters. So that, that's all pretty simple. Down here, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten devices attached to Ethernet. Remember, this is I.O. configuration, so back up to what you already know about any kind of programmable controller. Remember, the L in PLC was added many years ago to differentiate between a PC personal computer and a PC programmable logic controller. That's how PLC got started. It was originally just programmable controller. And then more recently, Rockwell's decided to call their newer platform with the Logix Engine programmable automation controllers, which this is one of those. But it's a PLC. When you configure your I.O., what you're doing is you're telling your program, your project, your program, that these are I.O. entities out there that it needs to query for input or update for output. 
Compact logic is a little bit different than control logic. Control logic is a passive backplane. That means that the backplane is passive in the process. When you power up a control logic, the first thing it does is it goes out and it says hello to everybody on the backplane and it says to slot one, slot one, here's what my program says that you are. Is this who you are at this rev level? And it comes back and says yes, basically. And then the processor says, okay, here's your responsibilities. It gives that module a lineup, tells it what to do, when to report its I.O., etc., and then it's done with it. And then it goes to the next slot and the next slot and so forth. So that's a passive backplane. Once you go into the run mode, all of these modules interact with the processor on their own. They update the memory in the processor at their own requested packet interval. Now, there's some variations to that, but we're, we're not going to uh, digress into that. The point is, if you add something to your I.O. configuration, you have basically enabled some form of communication that you're not, you're not really involved in anymore, programming-wise, between your processor, the L27 ERM, and all these devices on Ethernet. So when you added these, in order to add these, you had to have module-defined tags. So if I go up here to Assets and click on Module Defined, what I'm going to see is a lot more than was there before I added I.O. modules. Before I added I.O. modules, there was nothing there. And when I add these I.O. modules, all of this got added. These are if you want to call them templates, technically they're called classes of objects, information objects. But they're a class of objects, but these are not instances of that class of objects. So if you look at the very first group, all labeled A, B, colon, these are Alan Bradley module-defined tags. You look below that and you got FANUC Robot, FR. Then you've got the nomenclature that SMC uses for their remote I.O. devices that begin with underscore 0007 colon EX 600 SEN 34. That's the nomenclature for the hardware. And then within that hardware, you have these other, uh, I realize there's underscores there between uh, SEN 34 and the remainder. But you'll notice it is O for output, I for input, and word zero. Then you have the nomenclature for AMCI dual Ethernet devices. And you see you have SMD32E2 and SMD34E2. When I created the instances of these I.O. devices out there, then these module-defined tags became viewable in module defined group right there. These are not the instances. These are not the tags. These are so you can go look to see what's in that. So let's just pick one. SMD 23E2 inputs. If I double click on that, that's going to open up the template. And you see, this is all grayed out. You can't change this. You can't change the name. You can't do anything with it, but look at it. So I can say, oh, what's in that module defined tag? There it is right there. I can go look at it. I can't okay it. I can't apply it. I can just cancel or ask for help. I'm going to uh, close up these so you're not distracted by any of that. These are assets in the sense that these are the classes of objects that you have to work with in your program. If you add a new type of module, in other words, if you go to your IO configuration, right click new module, then you can add a new module. That's not what we're doing right now. Actually, we would go down here to Ethernet and do that. New module, we'll, we'll get into that here in a second. This whole area here was empty. There was nothing until you added an instance. And when you added the instance, and the instances are all down here, tied up down here in, in your IO configuration. When you added the instance, it brought in this template or class of objects 
for reference only. You can't do anything with any of this, but go look to see what's there. So uh, we've covered, these are all Allen Bradley, and that includes your uh, embedded I.O. And then it also includes the PowerFlex 525, up here's the 1732. I was looking for the 1732 and I got a little distracted. All of this is Allen Bradley class of objects for embedded I.O. All the way down here to the PowerFlex. The PowerFlex drive is not embedded into the controller. That's why the AB colon embedded stops here and it goes to PowerFlex. Okay, let's close up that and go back down here. You understand that by adding in these devices as I.O. configuration, you added them into the scan list, if you want to call it that. With a PAC, it's really not a scan list, but it is a connection list that the processor has to deal with because, before it can go from program mode to the run mode or when it boots up and goes to the run mode. It has to go through and resolve this to make sure everybody's there. If they're not there, then you're going to get little yellow triangles over here. You'll get little yellow triangles in front of these if the processor cannot find these entities that you said were there and it can't find them. Let's talk about the robots. Although I just explained the relationship between these devices, instances of classes of objects. So let's go back up here to assets module defined and go down here to FANUC robot standard robot plus eight bytes input one colon zero and output one colon zero. So the standard interface to a FANUC robot is eight bytes. Bytes are single integers. So you could say it's S-I-N-T, single integers, eight of them. What this is going to do, these classes of objects right here for FR standard robot plus these two classes of objects represent the instances that you're going to use in your program. So down in the IO configuration, you have each of these two represented three times. So uh, FANUC robot R30IB plus a SCARA one, SCARA two and SCARA three. You see there are three different IP addresses. Each one of these in your controller tags is going to have these two tags. So let's jump back up here to controller, controller tags. These tags down here, FANUC robot. There they are under SCARA, but SCARA 1 is what we name them. So here we have SCARA 1, SCARA 2, and SCARA 3. Notice that we have I1, O1, I1, O1, I1, O1. So here's our three instances of these three data types, or these, these two data types right here. Although you see three of them down here, you have one for SCARA 1, SCARA 2, and SCARA 3. This is the class of objects right here. And these are three instances of that class of objects. The purpose of bringing this into your IO configuration, the processor is going to go out through ethernet and it's going to do the communication for you with the robot. Okay, so the processor goes out and it lines up through ethernet IP, the communication with all these devices out there specifically we're talking about the fanuc robots because i think that's the main tripping point with some people is well how does the communication takes place that's the beauty of the logix engine and the io configuration that because there is a module defined data type for you to use that you didn't create that was it was already created for you it lines up that communication okay now we know where the processor gets its information for these uh, three tags here. Now let's go back to our buffer inputs. Close down controller tags, buffer inputs, and we go to robot. 
Okay, so there's our scale one colon input one dot input single integer zero. So notice that the tag element is our destination. In other words, we're taking and we are buffering the information that the processor basically lined up to get updates from the robot on a certain basis and is putting it into R1 underscore in single integer zero through seven or length of eight. So if we went back to our tags again, to controller tags, and we will just type in R1 that takes us down to R1N right here. Notice that's eight single integers. The way I've got these described is more about what's taking place on the other end at the robot. So at the other end on the robot, whoever programs the robot, they determine what information from robot one is going to go into the robot's digital outputs. Notice it's R1DO, one through eight. So it's robot one, digital output, bit one through eight. It's not zero through seven. That's not how FANUC does their uh, pointers, their descriptions or their tags. It's digital output one through eight, nine through 16 and so forth. So it's one through 64. Those are your eight, eight bit words or single integers. So on the other end, the robot programmer, they determine what gets put into those 64 bits for you to use on your end at the controller. So they did not create these descriptions. I had to create these descriptions because I know that on the other end that I am moving certain information into R1 underscore N single integer zero in my buffering the inputs. Remember back here, buffer inputs. So I'm moving that SCARA one tag input single integer zero into R1 input single integer zero. And I'm going to do that for all three of these robots. See, SCARA one, SCARA two, SCARA three. That's how the data gets from the robot to your controller. So you're going to use for, we'll say robot one, that's robot two, here's robot one. If you want to read the information from the robot, you're gonna read it from those eight single integers right there, R1 underscore N, zero through seven. Consequently, on the other end, buffer outputs, information you're sending to the robot, you're going to take down here in buffer outputs, We'll do the same one, robot one. When we want to tell the robot what to do or we want to send the robot information, we put that data in the tag R1 underscore out zero through seven. And then through the IO process that you can't see that runs in the background, asynchronous to the controller's processor scan, you're going to put values in R1 underscore out zero through seven, and the robot on the other end is going to see those. Here you see that we're taking the bits and words that you put information into, and we're putting in this tag, and these eight tags, output zero through seven, they are being sent over to the robot as part of the background function of the IO configuration. So that's how information gets back and forth between the robot and your controller. And all that you had to do was down in here, your IO configuration, and I can show you one right here, okay? Now y'all know how to add IO modules to ethernet or IO devices. So you right click, new module, this comes up, you go up here and you type in F A N and there you have it. There's your four types of uh, module defined data types that are given to you that you don't have to create yourself. Now, of course, we want the 30 IB plus because that's the controller that we're using. A FANUC robot R30 IB plus. That's all there is to it. You just added them in, 
gave them a name, uh, scare one, scare two, and scare three. Now all you have to do, and you don't even have to buff your inputs like I did. Okay, we'll go back up here. We'll collapse module define. We'll collapse, collapse assets. And we'll bring up just buffer outputs and buffer inputs. See? R. Program R, robot top cap. Program R, robot top cap. Buffer inputs, buffer outputs. You could, instead of using R1 underscore out 0 through 7, you could just use these eight single integers. However, we like to buffer I.O., remember, because it protects us from any unexpected behavior caused by asynchronous updating and handling of the data in the data table for the I.O. Because remember, this is a passive backplane, and these devices out there report on their schedule and they're not part of a fixed scan time or I.O. update time between scans of the programs. Okay, that's enough for this session. Um, we'll do at least one more because I wanted to talk about how I do sequences in those routines, in those programs that I showed you. There's also a matter if you're going to do, if you're going to make any program tags local, which basically takes the local tag and puts something in front of it that defines the path to that program's tag database. So we'll do at least one more talking about program structure. And time permitting down the road, maybe we'll talk about programming the CR30 safety relay and maybe some other things. So uh, that's it for this time. Thank you.